but uh, I won't give the name, but this person emailed me and uh, basically says, Pastor Mark, uh, I know you're extremely busy, but if you have time, would you please give me your insight on the following? Uh, he had put on his Facebook page uh, the weekly tour portion from the Temple Mount Institute. Have you guys ever heard of the Temple Mount Institute? Do you guys think it's a great website for learning? Well, anyway, um, it says how uh, it, they say it really touched my heart, uh, the tour portion from the Temple Institute, because it touched my heart to see how Jesus Christ was in what the rabbi had to say about the stone. Okay, I didn't listen to it, so I don't know exactly what he said. He probably didn't refer to Jesus Christ, but it was amazing when you listen to these rabbis, you can see how close they are. Well, anyway, uh, he let his pastor know about it, and this is the response he got back from his pastor concerning him going to the Temple Institute's website. The pastor said, I would avoid all teachings by the Temple Institute. Uh... He says, and I'm skipping here, I'm not reading the whole thing. The Apostle Paul would classify these things as Jewish fables, as mentioned in Titus. And he says, these folks interpret the Old Testament in a much different way than the Holy Spirit inspired New Testament writers. Paul warns us over and over to mark and avoid these people. They do nothing but harm. And then he says, uh, the Apostle Paul said, What's, wherefore serves the law? It was added because of transgressions. Uh, Galatians 3.19, it says, till the seed would come. And then he says, and that seed was Christ. There's no further point for keeping the law. To keep the law is an offense to Christ. And let's see. And then he says how Paul said of the entire old covenant system, he said that, that which he quotes Hebrews 8.13, misquotes it. Now that which is decaying and waxing old is ready to vanish away. And what's amazing is here's how he interpreted that verse. When Paul wrote to Hebrews saying that Judaism was decaying as a corpse, his words, not mine. I don't remember reading that in there. <laughs> and uh, he says, but I mean, anyway, it's just interesting. And then he, there's a lot more. And then he closes basically saying that doctrines like the ones espoused by this organization are fatal and would have been rejected by New Testament writers and Christians from the first century onward. They are dangerous to one's faith. So does that give you a hint of replacement theology here? Give you a good example. But anyway, it's out there. But you're going to hear some very interesting things tonight. Let's start with prayer. Father, we just thank you so much for your language. We thank you so much for your Torah, for your word. I pray, Lord, you would open the eyes of our hearts that we truly would understand how your Torah came from you. And it was your word, and your word stands forever. And we just thank you in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. How do you say dedication in Hebrew? Okay, and many of you probably know this. Some of you may not. Did you know that Jesus kept the Feast of Hanukkah? If you go to the Gospel of John, chapter 10, I believe it's around verse 22, it talks about how Jesus was on Solomon's porch. It was winter, and it was the Feast of Dedication. But for some reason, they don't want to put the Feast of Hanukkah. They put the Feast of Dedication. But uh, it's obviously that the Lord kept that feast as well. It's, it's, it's really cool that it's also we're about upon the Feast of Hanukkah. And I'll be sharing about the Feast of Hanukkah in a few weeks here. And people don't realize it. They Hanukkahed Moses' tabernacle or dedicated it. They Hanukkahed Solomon's temple. Uh, they Hanukkahed uh, the temple again after it was restored by Ezra and Nehemiah. Yes, Nancy. 10, chapter 10. I believe it's around verse 22. I'm not sure exactly but it's right around there. And, um, but anyway, how many of you, if I say Matthew 24, know what Matthew 24 is all about? You know, here Jesus is on the mount talking about the last days. But you know what's amazing? Matthew 24 is Hanukkah revisited. And if you don't know Hanukkah, then you don't understand Matthew 24, which is why it's a real good idea to understand the Feast of Hanukkah 
and the Feast of Dedication. I mean, as Christians, we know we need to dedicate our lives to the Lord, right? Well, that's what Hanukkah is all about. It's about dedication. So we'll be looking at that. So let's get started with John chapter 1 and verse 14. Tonight, uh, we're titling it Yeshua, the Living Torah. And I shared some of this, the very, very first lesson uh, that we ever had for the Cornerstone, but I'm going to expound a little bit on it and skip some of it because uh, we have covered part of it, but I want to touch base in some of these areas again. So let's start with John 1, 14. And it says, and the word became flesh. Now let me show you this PowerPoint. I like to think of it as the Torah became flesh and did tabernacle among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of an only begotten of a father full of grace and truth. So here we see the Torah is what became flesh. The living Torah, full of grace and truth. So Yeshua was the living Torah. He was full of grace and truth. Uh, many of you have been around for a while, so you're going to be familiar with this. But for those of you that haven't, let me show you the Hebrew word Torah. In the ancient picture language, the Torah was written as our letter T, which was like a cross. The Vav was a nail. The Resh means the head or the highest person. The He means to reveal or behold. So the very word Torah means to reveal the highest person nailed to the cross or the covenant. Or going this way, the covenant nailed to the highest person revealed or the covenant I mean, so the whole concept of Torah is revealing Messiah's death on the cross and redemption in the ancient picture language. So why would you want to do away with Torah when the Torah became flesh? And it's all about him revealing himself and the redemption story. Let me go to the next one. And, oh, I should have moved that one slide over a little bit, but I want to show you some uh, Hebrew here as well. Uh, he dwelt or to dwell is shakan. And you see the sheen, the kaf we just learned, and the letter noon at the end of a word changes shape. But there's shakan, which means to dwell, or he dwelt. And then a place of dwelling is called a mishkan. There's the mem, so mishkan. So the, Moses' tabernacle was called the mishkan, which is the place where the shekinah dwelt. So here's the dwelling glory is called the Shekinah. And then you'll notice you have the Sheen Kaf here. And so you have the Shekinah dwelt in the Mishkan where God Shekad. Do you see all that? And what I want you to think of too as a type of these bones and these animals are the, the pillars, the columns and the animal skins. Almost think of Yeshua's bones and flesh. Okay, coming to life, so to speak. But I just want you to see the difference between the Shekhan to dwell and Mishkan, a dwelling place, and the Shekinah is a dwelling glory. And here we see in John 1, the Torah became flesh. And uh, he dwelt among us. It says, the word became flesh and he tabernacled among us. And we beheld his, not its glory, but his glory. And so how many of you know we're instructed to do what Jesus did? Remember those bracelets, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Ah, I bet he'd keep Torah. <laughs> okay. What did Messiah think of his word? What did Messiah think of the Torah? What did Messiah think of the land of Israel? What did Messiah think of Jerusalem? Well, that's his throne. What did he think of the Jewish people, his relatives? Now, let me ask you, did... Messiah believe in his own everlasting promises regarding the land of Israel and the people of Israel? Don't you think he'd believe in his own word? Now let me ask you this. Did Yeshua agree with his mission for the Jewish people that they would be a light to the nations in reaching the world with his Torah or his instruction? Of course. Now is the Torah the word of God? And we know Torah equals instruction. Well, Think about this. The first thing Satan did in the garden was make Adam and Eve question God's Torah. What did Satan do? He, he made Adam and Eve question his Torah, question his instruction. Was that really what he said? Is that really what God meant? 
Why, God's word, he's harsh, he's mean. He won't let you eat of that tree. So let's take a look now also at Messiah's tour nature. In Colossians 2, 9, it says, For in him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Here at El Shaddai, we do believe in the deity of the Messiah. Okay, he was fully God, he was fully man. In uh, Exodus 34, verse 5 through 7, here it talks about how the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with Moses there and proclaims the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and he, wants, and he proclaimed, now listen to the name of the Lord. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin. Well, now how does that fit with Old Testament legalism, law, no grace, no mercy? Right here it is. He's proclaiming his name as full of grace, full of mercy in the Torah. The tabernacle also was the place where atonement was found, wasn't it? Okay, it was the place of grace and truth for the people of Israel. It was always about grace and truth and mercy. And I don't know if you knew this, but historically they found literature where the generation of Jewish believers, after the apostles had passed away, they referred to Yeshua as HaTorah, which is the Torah. They considered Yeshua as the Torah. Not just the correct interpretation of the Torah, not just the fulfillment of the Torah, but the perfect embodiment of the Torah. He was the Torah exhibited. So if the living Torah dwells in us, and the Torah is written on our hearts, then there's no burden or striving to perform. Does an apple tree have to strive to produce apples? It just comes naturally. So if, if the Torah, living Torah, dwells in us, okay, the Torah is written on our hearts, Loving God and loving others should come naturally. Oh man, do I have to love that person? You know. Let's take a look at Yeshua's Torah walk. Now this is where I'm going to take you on an interesting journey. Uh, let me go to the next clip. But I want you to notice here, here the wilderness. I have here Luke 4.1. It says, Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was what? Led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Do we want to be led by the Spirit? Okay, was Jesus led by the Spirit? And where did the Spirit take him into the wilderness? And do you know the word for wilderness is midbar? And do you know debar in Hebrew means word? So he was taken to the word. Okay, midbar. And when Yeshua was tempted in the wilderness, what did he fight back with? The Torah. Okay. He said, man does not live by bread only, but by what? Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. When Yeshua said that, the New Testament hadn't been written yet. Okay. When he said, man lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, what proceeds out of the mouth of God was what? The Torah. Then he also, he said, don't tempt the Lord your God. That also came from Deuteronomy. Then he also said, you shall fear the Lord your God and serve him only. That also came out of Deuteronomy. So the whole temptation in the wilderness, Yeshua overcame him with the Torah. Do you see why the devil doesn't want you guys to want anything to do with Torah? Because you've just lost your defense. Think about it. I think if the Torah was good enough for Yeshua, it should be good enough for us. If, to, if Yeshua felt he needed the Torah to defend, which is his own word, I think it'd be good enough for us. Now, what I want you to notice too, Yeshua was led by the Spirit. And if he's led by the Spirit and uses Torah, hmm, I think if we're led by the Spirit, maybe we should use Torah. Look at Deuteronomy 9.10. It says, and the Lord delivered unto me two tables of stone written with the finger of God. So can you imagine God's finger is writing not just the Ten Commandments, really, but a whole lot more. You'll see in a minute. It says right here, he gave me two tables of stone written with the finger of God, and on them was written according to all the words which the Lord spoke with you on the mount. So it wasn't just the Ten Commandments. It was everything he said in the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. Now look at Luke eleven twenty. 20. Here is 
an incident where Yeshua says, if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come to you. But here in Matthew 12, the same instance, it says, if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God. So the finger of God is the same as the Spirit of God. And so if the finger of God is the same as the Spirit of God, we see the Spirit of God is the one who wrote the commandments. So the Spirit of God is not opposed to law. The Spirit of God wrote the law. Look at Ezekiel 36, 26 and 27. Here it says, a new heart I'm going to give you, and a new spirit I'm going to put in you. I'm going to take away the stony heart out of your flesh. I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. Now look at this. I'm going to put my spirit within you. And what is the spirit going to do when it gets inside of you? He's going to cause you to walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. Not oppose them and have nothing to do with them. Look at Jeremiah 31. Behold, the days come, says the Lord. I'm going to make a new covenant. How many of you have heard of the new covenant? Okay. Who's the new covenant with? It says the new covenant's with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And it's not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is going to be the covenant that I'm going to make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I'm going to put my Torah in their inward parts. I'm going to write their Torah in their hearts. So now Yeshua, in the Torah, he takes the Spirit of God or the finger of God and writes his Torah on stone. Now that same Spirit of God, finger of God, is going to write the Torah on your hearts. So it's not a different Torah, it's a different location. And I will be their God and they'll be my people. And they'll teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they're all going to know me from the least to the greatest, says the Lord. And I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Now, here comes the transition. I want you to watch this because I really, this, there's a verse I'm going to share with you that's so misunderstood and I want you to get it. So I'm going to lay a foundation here. In Jacob chapter 1, verse 25, I say Jacob because that was his name, but it says, whoever looks into the perfect law of what? What? The law brings liberty? And he says, and continues therein, being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer, this man will be blessed in his deed. What does the word shema mean? Hear and do. And here we see the perfect law of liberty is one who hears and does. Now let's look at Psalms 119, verse 41 through 48. But before I do that, I want to show you this picture here. Who knows what this is? The Statue of Liberty. Now, when the people, immigrants, are coming from yonder shores, and they come and they see the Statue of Liberty, do they think, all right, America, the Statue of Liberty, we can now rape, pillage, steal, murder. No laws at all. Does liberty mean no laws at all? How about on our southern border? How about the northern border? Or do we say liberty means you can just come across and do anything you want to do, however you want to do it? Is that what liberty means? Does liberty mean no law? Of course it doesn't. Look at Psalms 119, 41 through 48. In case you didn't know, Psalms 119 is made up of the Hebrew alphabet. And you only see this in Hebrew, but there's eight verses committed to each letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And in those eight verses of every letter, the first letter begins with that letter of the Hebrew alphabet, that word. Well, this is the section on the letter Vav. And what's interesting, the Vav is a nail. But look at what it says. Let your mercies come also to me, O Lord, even your Yeshua. According to your word, so shall I have wherewith to answer him that reproaches me, for I trust in your word, and take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in your judgments. Now look at what he says. I'm going to keep your Torah continually forever and ever, and I will what? What? By keeping Torah, you're walking in liberty? For I seek your precepts. I will speak of your testimonies also before kings and won't be ashamed. I will delight myself in your commandments. He's going to delight in the commandments, which I love. 
my hands also will I lift up into your commandments, which I've loved, and I will meditate in your statutes. Man, here's, now did David love God? Did God love David? And yet here David says, there's liberty in keeping Torah. Now let's go to that crazy book, Galatians, and the Apostle Paul, Rabbi Shaul. In verse 13 through 17, he says, For brethren, you have been called unto what? We just got done reading. The Torah brings what? And he says, You've been called to liberty, but don't use your liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Okay, now we're getting into the heart of the matter. But by love, serve one another. So here we see the Torah is not the problem. It's the misuse of the Torah. That's the problem. He says, for all of the Torah is fulfilled in one word, even in this, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But what happens if you bite and devour one another? Take heed that you be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh, for the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. So imagine this big warfare going on. Who's in one corner? The spirit, okay? The Torah, the spirit of the Torah. And what's over on this side? Man's flesh, man's traditions, man wanting to do things my way, okay? Now let's go on, look at Galatians 5, 19 through 26. So it's talking about this war between this, not the spirit and the Torah, but the war between the spirit and the flesh. And it goes on to say, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, and heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But now it's going to talk about the fruit of the Spirit, or Torah, which is love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance. Against such there is no law. Everyone's familiar with that, right? There is no law that you can come against when it comes to the Spirit and love and Torah. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the spirit, let's walk in the spirit. Let's not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. So here's the battle is between the spirit and Petora on that side. And over here is the flesh. And that's the war, right? But now, let me ask you this. Are these things spoken against in the Torah Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance. All those things are spoken against in the Torah, right? Because the spirit and Torah are against the flesh. It's against those things. Okay, now let's look at Romans 7, 21 through 23. Paul says, I find then a law. Now, is that Torah or another law? How many have heard of the law of gravity? There's a lot of laws. And here he says, I'm finding a law that when I want to do good, evil's present with me. For I delight in what? Okay, so he says, I delight in the law of God, but there's this other stinking principle, this other law that's in me. He says, I see another law. So when he says another law, he's not talking about Torah. He's talking about another principle. Another law that's in my body that wars against the law of my mind. So here we have another law. You got the law of Torah. You've got the law of my mind. There's this, this other law which brings me into captivity to another law. The law of what? So you got a law of sin. You've got the law of my mind. You've got the law of Torah. There's this law of sin in my members. How many of you have wrestled with this law of sin in your members? You know what I'm talking about? Now, is that Torah or is that the law of sin that's within us? That's not Torah. That's just this law of sin within us. Now, look at Romans 7, 25. He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh, I serve what? 
Okay, so over here we have, in one corner of this boxing match, we have the spirit. We have the Torah, the law of God. Over here in this corner, we have the flesh and the law of what? Okay, is liberty found in the law of sin or is liberty found in the law of God? Okay, Romans 8, 24. For the law of the spirit of what? Is it death or life? Okay, so the Torah's life. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from what? The... All right. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemns sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law of God might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Okay, so right here is telling you that the law is righteous, and Christ fulfilled the law, and now it says the righteousness of the law is to be fulfilled in us. So in other words, Christ says, okay guys, you're misunderstanding the Torah, Torah. you're beating each other up with the Torah, I'm going to show you how to live Torah, and now we live Torah. Just like I said before, did Yeshua honor his father and mother? Was that a fulfillment of the law? Does that mean we now don't have to honor our father and mother because Jesus did it? Does that even make sense? Well, Jesus fulfilled the law, therefore I don't have to. Okay, well, Jesus honored his father and mother, therefore I don't have to. No, no, he was the example of how to honor your father and mother, so now we know how to honor our father and mother. Okay, now look at Romans 8, 7. It says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the Torah, neither indeed can it be. So here you see again, you have the mind of the, the carnal mind over here, and you have the law of God over here, they're battling each other, the carnal mind wants nothing to do with the law of God. It's centered on flesh. The problem that we have is mankind wants in our flesh to submit to the law of God, and there's a big battle there. It just doesn't work, does it? Well, now let's look at Galatians 5.18. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. There's that verse. If you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Which law are they talking about? Oh, is he saying now we have a license to sin? So the Spirit of God who gave us the Torah and fights against the flesh now says we can indulge the flesh? What, is, what law is he talking about? He's talking about the law of sin and death, not Torah. So if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law of sin and death. He's not referring to the, if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the Torah. The law he's talking about is the law of sin and death because you're walking in liberty. Does that make sense? It's the wrong, when you look at everything in context, what he's talking about, you can see when he says, if you're led by the Spirit, you're not going to be under the law of sin and death because you're walking in liberty. Okay, now here's another thing. Let's look at Messiah's clothing. What did Yeshua wear? Do you think Yeshua wore fringes on his garment? Do you think he wore a tallit? Do you think he had tchelet tied on his garments? Of course he did. Do you think Yeshua looked like this? How about this? With a Greek text. Maybe he, Yeshua looked like that. I don't know about you, but I'm about ready to throw up. How about that one? No. How about at the Last Supper? Do you think at the Last Supper, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, he had a big loaf of bread in his hand? I mean, this is what happens with the Greek mindset. We create God in our own image. How many of you heard of Rabbi Shaul? Do you think Rabbi Shaul looked like this or looked like this? Let's go back again. Which one do you think grabbed by Shaul? The Apostle Paul. That one? Or that one? Okay. We went over his clothing. Now let's take a look at his calendar. Do you think Yeshua kept his own calendar? He kept all the feast days? Of course he did. Now, this is a, a verse I threw in just because there are some 
Jews out there that believe the Sabbath is only for the Jews. They're not for anyone else but the Jews. But I think it's interesting, in Mark 2, 27, Yeshua said to them, the Sabbath was made for everybody and not man for the Sabbath. So it's for all mankind to stop doing things for themselves and start caring for others. That's what Yeshua did. He spent the Sabbath. He still did things. See, that's when he healed the sick. That's when he did all kinds of things. It's one day to forget about yourself, guys, and concentrate on someone else. Now, what about these Torah conflicts? Some say Yeshua did away with the Torah. And they'll give an example of the adulterous woman in John 8, 1 through 5, where it says Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery. You notice this, it says it was in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? So they want to test Yeshua here to see if he's going to go against Torah. Well, who wrote the book? Do you think he knows it back and forth and inside out? And so people will say, see, Jesus did away with the Torah and he showed grace and mercy to the adulterous woman. Well, no, wait a minute. You don't understand. First off, look at Psalm 85.10. It says, mercy and truth, what? That's right. Mercy and truth go together. Let me show you a clip here. Right here is a picture of the temple facing east. Right here is what was called the Chamber of the Hewn Stone. Okay, it was on the north side. Let me give you another picture. Here it is, right here, the temple faced east, north side. This was the Chamber of the Hewn Stone. Basically, that was where the Supreme Court met on temple precincts. There was no separation of church and state. They went together. And they had the, a little Sanhedrin and a great Sanhedrin. And only the great Sanhedrin could try capital cases, okay? Now, this is a book that I recommend you get if you want to. It's called A History of the Jewish People, the Second Temple Era. So this is the history of the Jewish temple written by Jewish people about what it was like during the time of the Messiah, basically, or this, yeah, that era. But I want to read this so you can get an idea of what the Jews said was going on during the time of Messiah. It says two things occurred that should have made people realize catastrophe was impending and only repentance and good deeds could avert the evil decree. And talk about the temple being destroyed in 70 AD. <clears throat> but one of the things was this, the great Sanhedrin left the chamber of the hewn stone and exiled itself to a place on the outside of the Temple Mount, outside the Temple area. It says, only when the Sanhedrin sat in the Temple area did other courts have the right to try capital cases. And then it says this, when was the Temple destroyed? So 40 years prior puts us at, which is when Messiah was there. And they say right here, 40 years before the destruction of the Temple, the rich, the aggressive, and even some of the high priests begin to engage gangs of robbers and murderers to tyrannize the people and enrich themselves with the loot of the weak and the poor. So when people were coming for the feasts, they would hire gangs to pickpocket them and loot and steal. So it was a corrupt regime. How many of you remember Hurricane Katrina and how total chaos was resulting? That's what it was like during Yeshua's time. It was total chaos. And it says this, consequently, the Jewish courts were powerless to prosecute these rich, wealthy politicians, okay? So faced with a situation in which they could not enforce the law, the Sanhedrin said it is better not to even try them at all rather than to sentence them according to the law without being able to carry it out. These events mentioned above occurred during the rule of Pontius Pilate. This is what they say. And so what happened, what this is telling you is this. Do you remember when it came to Yeshua dying, the Jews said, according to our law, we can't? Because that's the reason why. 
They'd left the chamber of the hewn stone so they couldn't crucify him according to their law. What this is telling you, the story with the adulterous woman was not a Jewish court, it was a mob. The stoning of Stephen was a mob. The whole time of Yeshua was mob rule during the reign of Pontius Pilate. So it wasn't the Jewish court sanctioning these people to die. The Jewish courts threw their hands up and said, forget it. We don't even want to do any capital cases. So it was just mass chaos. That's what was going on. It wasn't the Jewish courts. And so here you have these people coming to Yeshua, trying to use Moses to stone a woman when according to even their own law, they couldn't stone her because the great Sanhedrin wasn't meeting. But let's look at the Torah. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10, it says here, and the man that commits adultery with another man's wife, even he that commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Well, if they were caught in the very act, where's the man? And look at Deuteronomy 19.15. It says, One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin, and any sin that he sins at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. So therefore, what this is saying is when it comes to the death penalty, one witness isn't even good enough. You have to have at least two witnesses. So according to Torah law, you have to have two witnesses to this act. And then look at Deuteronomy 17, 6. It says, at the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness, he shall not be put to death. Now look at this. The hands of the witnesses shall be what? First upon him to put him to death and afterward the hands of all the people. So you should put evil away from among you. So when it came to the adulterous woman, Yeshua says, okay, you wanna play that game? You wanna go by Torah rules? Who are the two witnesses that saw it? Because you have to be the first one to stone her. That's the first thing, then everyone else can. So now he's saying, okay, which, which two of you were the witnesses who saw this? First off, you've already blown it because you didn't bring the man. Well, who do you think wants to be the first witness that says I saw it when you read this next verse? Deuteronomy 19, 16 through 19. If a false witness rise up against anyone to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord. And what is happening right now in the case of the adulterous woman? They're all standing literally before the Lord. Before the priests and judges, which will be in those days, and the judge shall make what? Diligent inquisition. So the Yeshua is going to say, you want to play that game? Okay, I'm going to make diligent inquisition. I'm going to ask where the man is. I'm going to ask all about different things. Find out is, your, is the problem you're a peeping Tom? You know, what's, what's the problem here? What is the truth of this matter? And it says, and behold, if the witness be a false witness and has testified falsely against his brother, then you shall do to him as he had thought to have done to his brother. So he put evil away from you. So you were saying, okay, which one of you wants to be the first witness to pick up the stone? I'm gonna make diligent inquisition and we're gonna take that stone and we're gonna stone you if you're a false witness. Kind of to give you a good reason why they didn't want to go pick up the stone. It's like, I'm out of here. Yeshua is saying, you want toward justice? I'll show you toward justice. And then look at John 8, 10. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? So what did she get? She received Torah mercy. Because Torah mercy says, if there's no witnesses, you're not condemned. So Yeshua didn't do away with Torah. He was enforcing Torah righteously and with mercy. So now let's take a look at Yeshua and the people of Israel. Let me ask you this. What tribe was Yeshua from? Judah. That makes him a Jew. <gasps> oh my goodness. I thought he was a Christian. Yeshua was a Jew. Look at Deuteronomy 17, 15. It says, You shall in any wise set him king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brethren shall you set king over you that you may not set a stranger over you which is not your brother. So therefore, Yeshua, if he's going to be the king over Israel, has to be Jewish. 
especially from the tribe of Judah, because that's where the kings came from. Matthew 12, 17 and 18, it says that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him. He will show judgment to the Gentiles. Well, when he says, my behold, my servant, he's quoting Isaiah 42, 1 through 3, where he says, behold, my servant, whom I uphold, my elect, in whom my soul delights, I put my spirit upon him. He'll bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. And so we see Yeshua was the servant of Israel. And he's the servant of Israel. Not only is he the king of Israel, he's the servant of Israel. Remember, he says, if you want to be the greatest, you got to be what? And so because he's the servant of Israel, he's also the king of Israel. And then it says, he shall not cry nor lift up nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and the smoking flax he will not quench. He'll bring forth judgment unto truth. So here we see again, mercy and truth meeting each other, judgment and truth meeting each other. In Isaiah 44, 6, look at this. It says, thus saith the Lord, the king of Israel. And his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I'm the first and the last. There's, beside me, there's no God. Then look what we see in John 12, 13. They took branches of palm trees, went forth to meet him, and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel that comes in the name of the Lord. So Yeshua was called the King of Israel. Notice he was not called the King of England. He was not called the King of Spain. He was not called the King of America. He's called the King of Israel. Why do you think he's going to return to the land of Israel? Why do you think this big problem is about Israel right now? Satan is trying to prevent the king of Israel from claiming his land and his throne in Jerusalem. I'm going to show you that here. You see, in Luke 19, 41 through 44, Yeshua wept over Jerusalem. He came near and he beheld the city and he wept over it, saying, if only you had known at least in this your day, the things which belong to your peace. But now they're hid from your eyes. The days are going to come upon you that your enemies will cast a trance about you, compass you round, and keep you in on every side. They're going to lay you even with the ground. Look at Matthew 23, 37. He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you that kill the prophets, stone them which are sent to you. How often would I have gathered your children together, even as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not. Did Yeshua love the people of Israel? You bet he did. He wept over them. How many of us have wept over our kids because they've gone astray, okay, or our relatives? Well, here Yeshua, he, he's weeping over his relatives. And look at Yeshua in the land of Israel. I think this is my last clip. Pretty small area when you look at it from the air. Look at Joel 3, 1 and 2. It says, For behold, in those days and in that time, when I bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, he says, I'm going to gather all nations I'm going to bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage, Israel. Look at this. He, doesn't, he says, my people, my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted what? Whoops. Any nation that takes part in parting God's land is going to have the wrath of God because whose land is it? It's God's land. That's why this commotion is a little tiny. Do you realize, again, the nation of Israel will fit between Seattle and Olympia? Why is the whole world upset at this little country that is, averages 40 miles wide? And it's insane. It's because it's, it's demonic, guys. <clears throat> and God's going to come against those nations that try to part his land. In Genesis 12, 7, he appeared to Abram and he said, Unto your seed will I give this land. Well, who is the seed of Abraham that all the promises applied to was Yeshua. So the land of Israel literally, I'm telling you, the land of Israel literally belongs to Yeshua. And how would you like to have someone come and take your inheritance? That rightfully belong to you. Well, the nations are trying to take Yeshua's inheritance from him. And he takes that rather personally. Micah 4, 1 and 2, it says, in the last days... It'll come to pass, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established in the top of the mountains. It'll be exalted above the hills. People will flow to it. Many nations are going to come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways. We will walk in his paths. And the Torah is what's going to come out of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. 
So here we see the Lord is going to reign in Israel, in Jerusalem, and what is he going to teach everybody? Torah. So can we say, how many of you believe the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever? So he's going to say, Torah good. Oop, now Torah bad. Oop, now Torah good. He's not going to do that. And in Zechariah 14, 3 and 4, we see his feet land on the Mount of Olives when he comes. Again, Israel is his focus. Jerusalem is the city. This is where he's going to rule and reign from. This is why the devil doesn't want Yeshua to come back. So he feels like he can thwart prophecy. That's what he's trying to do. So lastly, I have Yeshua and the nations. This is the good news. How does, we saw how Yeshua felt about Israel, the land. We saw how Yeshua felt about his people. We saw how Yeshua felt about his scriptures or his word. Now let's look what Yeshua thinks of the other nations. Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Yeshua told his disciples, go therefore and teach all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. Did he command them to do anything outside of Torah? No. So the Great Commission meant take Torah to the nations. As a matter of fact, look at the Torah, Deuteronomy 4, 5 through 8. It says, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do so in the land where you're going to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your what? It's your wisdom, it's your understanding in the sight of the nations, which are going to hear of all these statutes and say, what a legalistic bunch of goofballs these guys are. <laughs> oh, that's not what it says. It says, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who is a God so nigh to them as the Lord our God in all things that we call upon him for? What nation is there so great and has statutes and judgments so righteous as all of this Torah? That for heaven's sake we want to do away with all these righteous laws. We want to have laws like... We can have prostitution, and we can have gambling, and we can have drugs. I mean, look at Purim. When you study the book of Purim and the book of Esther, they were full of laws. But it was all laws like, get plastered as much as you want. Look at their laws. They were full of laws. They were a nation of laws. But they were all unrighteous laws. John 10, 14 through 16. He says, I'm the good shepherd, I know my sheep, and I'm known of mine, as the Father knows me, even so know I the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. Now look at this. He says, there's other sheep that I have, which are not part of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there'll be one fold and one shepherd. Do you know this is quoting Isaiah 56, 8, where he says, the Lord God is going to gather the outcasts of Israel. Yet, he says, will I also gather others to him? beside those that are gathered unto him. So not only is he going to gather the outcasts of Israel, he's also going to gather non-Jews, but they're going to be gathered to Israel. He's going to be one shepherd with one fold. So he loves all the nations of the world. So what he did, he first he started with Adam and Eve. One man, Adam blew it. So then he says, okay, I'm going to have Abraham, and I'm going to create a nation, and I'm going to show the whole world what it's like to serve me. I'm going to have a nation that's going to serve me, and it's, they're going to have my, obey my laws and my statutes, and the whole world is going to say, what a wonderful nation it is. But Israel blew it as well. And so now he's going to restore Israel back, and they're going to obey, and they're going to be a light to the nations, and they're going to fulfill their mission. And guess what? We get to be a part of it. Hallelujah. Woo! So let's stand and pray. Father, we just thank you so much for your Torah, for your word, that we're living in the culmination of all history. We're living at the, the time of the Super Bowl of all history. This is what all the angels desired to look into, all the prophets desired to look into, is this day that we are living in. And you created each one of us because you needed us alive right here at this time in this day because you have something for each and every one of us to do. It's, it's hard to believe, but you wanted us alive. So many of the prophets wanted to be alive at this time, but you picked us to be here at this time because you've given us all a mission to be a light to the nations, to take your tour to the nations. I pray, God, you would equip us. Father, that we would be burning torches of your Torah, of your instruction, and fulfill the mission you've called us 
to do. And I just thank you, Father, that you're going to take that burning love of, and grace and mercy and truth of the Torah and use it through each and every person here to show people how you are a good, great, merciful God. You always were. You always will be. You truly are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we just thank you in Yeshua's name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for studying with us today. If you have any questions regarding the material discussed, please contact me at my email address. It's Pastor Mark at El Shaddai Ministries. Be blessed and shalom.